friend Bernie, and he came to my house during the Thanksgiving holiday in the United States. And Thanksgiving is a time when people come together and eat lots of food and watch lots of American football. But it's sort of a family time, and it's a time when I make many, many different uh, cakes that I don't usually make during the rest of the year. So I make apple tarts, and I make pumpkin pies, and this is a very special one. It's a ginger pudding cake. Very good, and uh, I'll share the recipe after the lecture with anyone who, who cares to have it. Um, here. Right. I think my battery will last. Okay. Yes, I stole right. your... Uh... Oh, I did. Okay. Um, that's okay. Um, so it's, it's, it's special things. It's unusual things. It's not the things that I do every day for Thanksgiving. Special desserts, special spices, special foods. This is my everyday kitchen. In my everyday kitchen, I have things that I use every day and I keep them close at hand. So I have my coffee machine and it's on, my, it's on a low shelf in my kitchen. I don't have to reach up high to get my coffee machine. I use it every day. So I keep it right at hand. The things that I use for Thanksgiving once a year, those are the things on the high shelf that I have to reach for. So I've organized my life, I've organized my kitchen around the things that are everyday things that are useful every day in my life and the things that I have to reach for, that I have to think about, that aren't always available. And so the, the, the question comes down to, for me, this is a school of education. You're making decisions about what belongs on the low shelf, what's going to be readily at hand for our children versus what are the things they have to reach for. And also, how are they going to reach for things that are high? So we want to think about what are the everyday tools that children of today need to be successful in life and how are we going to populate that. So I, I'm going to argue that computation should be on every child's low shelf. Now we had a discussion at lunch and at the end of the discussion it, it was argued that uh, you know, um, even, even a, a pencil is, is technology, and unless you use the pencil to, to, to write, it's not doing much good. And computation is a technology, and we need to think about how we use computation in order to make this argument that it belongs as an everyday tool. Before I begin, I want to actually share a definition of technology. So we're going to talk about technology, we should agree upon a definition. The definition I like best comes from Alan Kay. Alan defined technology as anything invented after you were born. <laughs> and the reason why I like that definition is it takes technology down off its pedestal. Technology is just stuff. And computation should just be stuff. It should be like a pencil to our children. Computation is actually nothing very special today. It's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. And so we have to decide are we going to uh, it, 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 introduce children to the, the power that computation affords as a routine part of the schooling. So, our objective is not learning, but learning to learn. And the reason it's learning to learn is because the world is changing, and the world is always going to be changing. And I think with, with all of us, everyone in this room, I think, um, has had to spend a lot of time learning after their formal education, in addition to the learning they did during their formal education, in order to be successful in the things they're doing today. Learning doesn't ever stop. Learning is part of being alive. It's part of being human. And so, if the children and if the adults, if the children and the teachers are going to be out in the world, they need to be able to always learn. So learning how to learn is it's, it's, um, as important as any individual piece of curriculum um, that, that they might be exposed to. How do we go about it? Well, we argue 
that it's important to explore the world, have access to knowledge. There's lots of knowledge out there that is, uh, is important. There's lots of knowledge out there that we can't expect every child to discover on their own. So, for example, uh, let's take calculus. Calculus, um, in, in the history of mankind, in, in, in since, at least since recorded history, so for tens of thousands of years, calculus has only been invented twice. Only two times was calculus ever invented. So to expect that any child or every child is going to invent calculus on their own, I think is setting an ex expectation that's a little bit ridiculous. It's an example of something that we have to let them explore, but we have to guide them to that exploration. Now, there are many, many things that might fall into that category, and when you define curricula, certainly one of the things you take into account are the things that, that are, are important that you want to make sure the, that the students uh, discover that they explore. But being exposed to these things is not enough. In addition, you have to be expressive with the things that you find. Because unless you are expressive with your knowledge, you don't truly appropriate that knowledge. That knowledge doesn't belong to you until you use it, until you're expressive with it. And so we balance exploring with expression. And we give tools for exploration, the usual things, web browsers and the like, some unusual things, sensors and, and other scientific instrumentation, and we also balance that with tools of expression. Again, the usual things, word processing so they can write, painting programs. But we also include in that mix uh, multimedia. We include in that mix programming and computation. So it's, it's a very rich mix of exploration and expression. But there's one more thing that we include that's fundamental to learning, and that's reflection. Because unless you stop and reflect upon what you're doing, you're not really learning. Unless you stop and, and evaluate and critique what you're working on, you're not learning. So the tool has to encompass all three of these characteristics in order to be of value. So Rodrigo always gets to show the pictures of the kids with laptops because he does the hardware. I do the software. It's hard to take a picture of software. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I like to have a picture of kids with laptops too. And this is my favorite one. And the reason why I like this picture is uh, because there's these two beautiful girls smiling with their, their computers. But I'm going to put the emphasis on the word their computers because what they've done is they've taken the computers and they put stickers on them. They've, they've personalized the computer. They've made the computer their own. And the reason why this makes me feel so good, this picture, is because when we designed the computer, we designed the computer, we put a lot of effort into thinking about every detail, and we thought the computer's perfect. And the computer was so perfect that we don't want it to change. And we designed it so that the children couldn't put st stickers on it because that would change the computer. And it, it was too beautiful to let the children put their stickers on it. And yet you can see that the children actually put stickers on the computer despite our best efforts to prevent them. The children want to put stickers on the computer that we designed to prevent them from putting stickers. And I celebrate the fact that they were successful in doing that. I celebrate the fact that they had a problem they wanted to solve and they figured out a way to solve it despite all the, the best efforts of engineering to prevent them from solving their problem. And so a lot of what, what ends up happening is that we want to in, in, encourage the children to um, follow their, their, their passions and break down the, the artificial barriers that engineers and politicians uh, pre present to them. Here's um, really the, 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 the central slide of, of my presentation, which is um, we need to raise a generation of problem solvers. They've got to learn to solve problems and learn that they can solve problems. And a, a favorite example of mine, this is not the factory, this is in uh, 
the, the children repairing the laptops themselves. When we first built the laptop, we, we had a, a beta machine, a machine that wasn't mass production yet. And in the beta machine, we, we deployed it as, in a pilot in Abuja, Nigeria. And the computers had a flaw. They were defective in that the cable that connected the keyboard to the display was one millimeter too short. So the keyboard connector in here was too short, and it would, it would come loose. And it would have to be reseated. And so the children figured out, they set up a laptop hospital in the back of the classroom, and they fixed the computers themselves. So again, they, they, they confronted a problem, they solved their problem, but they also in the process learned that they can solve problems. These same children in this particular school in Nigeria, they speak uh, the, the, this language, Igbo. Igbo is one of the, the main languages, one of the three principal languages of Nigeria, Igbo, Hausa, and Yoruba. And so we gave the children their computer with the interface in Igbo. We should naturally want to give them a computer in the language that, that they use. The, the problem was that while we gave them Igbo for the interface, the word processor didn't have an Igbo spelling dictionary. So when they would spell a word, type in the word processor, it would highlight their Igbo as being misspelled because it was using an English spelling dictionary instead of Igbo. So what did the children do? They built their own spelling dictionary and solved their problem. Once again, the children had a problem, they solved their problem, and again, they learned that they can solve problems. So it's, it's this sort of change in, in, in culture that, that we're trying to, to pursue with this. There's a, a, a product, a very popular product in the United States, and I've seen quite a bit of that same product here in Chile. Um, it's called the Apple iPhone. How many of you have an iPhone? Wow, very high percentage. Well, in, in the United States, Apple's got a very, very aggressive advertising campaign. And apparently, they must have a big advertising campaign here, too, because they suckered all of you into paying lots of money for their product. But um, the advertising campaign in the United States goes like this. They say, there's an app for that. And what there's an app for that means is that whatever you want to do, whatever you need, we've got the solution for you. We'll give it to you. And so the iPhone is an example of a service. It's a product that offers you services from, uh, from Apple, from the phone company. And that's great. It's a very useful device. It does everything. There's an app for anything you want to do. But I question when it comes to education, when it comes to learning, is that the right model? Do we want to have a situation where everything's complete, all the problems have been solved, there's an app for that? Or do we want to put the children in a situation where they are confronted by problems, where they have something that's incomplete, where they have to not just download the app, download the service, but they have to be expressive, they have to be reflective. They've actually got to engage in debugging and working out the problem. So we can, if we're Apple, we can give them a complete world. Everything's polished and, 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 and beautiful. You do it the Apple way. Or we can give them something that's a little bit messy. And in that messy world, they're going to actually make mistakes, they're going to engage, they're going to do things, they're going to break things and they're going to learn. And they're going to learn that they can learn. And they're going to learn that, that they can do things that Apple never thought of. And they're going to learn that they don't have to have this dependency on some third party, but they can be an independent thinker and, and make things and do things for themselves. So, God knows that the children of this world are inheriting some very challenging problems. And what can we give them to help them deal with that world? Well, we can give them access to, uh, to God, and certainly that's one of the things that this university is about. But we also can give them other tools. So we can give them their faith, but we can also give them some other tools. So, Marvin Minsky once said that the, 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 the playfulness of childhood is the most 
demanding teacher will ever have. And I'm going to actually uh, allude to another colleague of mine, Henry Jenkins. And Henry, I know, has visited uh, Santiago many times, and some of you have studied with Henry. Um, Henry is a professor at MIT, and he studies fans. But he's not in the mechanical engineering department. He's not studying the kind of fan that pushes air. He studies fans of television shows. He studies fans as in fandom. And in, I first met Henry in the 1980s, and Henry was studying a particular kind of fan. He was studying um, fans of the television show Star Trek. And he would talk about these, these fans that were doing something that in the 1980s was very unusual and very difficult. They were remixing Star Trek episodes to make their own episodes of the, of the show. So they would take Star Trek television shows, they'd have them recorded onto cassettes, videotape. Probably some of you don't even know what videotape is. Um, and, uh, and then they would make their own music videos, their own little episodes, their own stories, narratives for these, these characters that they love so much. And as Henry's describing this tedious process, he's describing these people that are three or four standard deviations away from normal. He's, he's basically describing these people as freaks. These people who engage in remixing, these extreme fans of these television shows, of these narratives. And while he's talking, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm getting very nervous, I'm getting very agitated, because I'm thinking about my children. Because my children at this time were, were uh, just, you know, five, six, seven years old at the time when I first met Henry. And I was thinking about their behavior, and I was saying, uh oh, my children are weirdos. My children are. Or, or weird just the way Henry's fans are weird, because my children, when they would read a book, they'd illustrate it. When they would hear a story, they'd play act the characters from the story. They were doing all the things that Henry's fans were doing. And I was saying, oh, I've done something wrong with my children. They're growing up to be these weirdos like Henry's. And then I, but then I said, wait a second. My children's friends all do the same thing. Whenever they you know, hear a wonderful story, they internalize that story and they build from it, they embellish it, they add to it, they, 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 they live it. And, and I got thinking, you know, back, again, back to what, what Marvin has to say, actually being a fan, engaging deeply in, in and expressing from what you've explored and learned and heard when you hear a beautiful story, a beautiful poem, taking that in, internalizing it, and doing something with it, that's a natural part of childhood. It's a natural part of what we do as, as humans. But then there's something about school that says, don't do that anymore. So that it's school and society that say that Henry's fans are, are weirdos. It's not, it, the, the natural state is to be inquisitive. The natural state is to be expressive. And so one of, the, one of our goals is to sort of turn the table on that and, and make that e e expressiveness, make that um, passion about telling the story, that passion about really being engaged, be the everyday, the natural, be the norm. So we have some very simple axioms that we operate by. The first is, is that while, while information might be a, a, a noun, Learning's a verb. Learning's action. Learning's not something that happens to you. Learning's something that you do. And so we, we, we put a real emphasis on the doing. And if we want more learning, we want more doing. So everything we do within the, 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 the software is to encourage you to do more. Not encourage you to be passive and wait for the learning service to put learning objects in your head, but rather to really encourage you to, to do and, 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 and make and, and engage. And then finally, uh, this is a quote from Albert Einstein, love is a better master than duty. And let me give an example. This is a school in Lima. It's actually a very fancy school. Most of the schools in Peru are not like this. Um, and this, it, it, you can't really see in the slide, but this, this young boy is typing He's writing in a chat application, a chat program. And he's 
at very busy typing away. You can see there's a whole screen full of things he's typed. And he's actually chatting with a little girl sitting right next to him. He's chatting with his girlfriend. Now, on the surface, this is, is just, you know, some kid chatting. He probably should be doing his lessons. At least he's chatting through the computer instead of talking in class and disturbing everyone else. He shouldn't talk in class. But in fact, what's happening is something a little bit more subtle. He's writing. He's writing. What do we want these kids to do? We want them to write. And so, you know, in, in a subversive way, we're taking advantage of his passion and getting him to engage in, in part of the, the, our, 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 our curriculum, which is getting him to write and write and write. I want to talk a little bit about the penguin. The penguin is, is one of the symbols of free software. And free software is fundamental to this project. And the reason why free software is fundamental to this project is because, not because free software is free, it's not because we don't pay for free software, although Rodrigo certainly appreciates the fact that he doesn't have to pay a tax to Microsoft whenever he distributes one of his computers. We don't want to have to, to but there's no reason to pay that money to Microsoft. But more important, what free software represents is a culture. It represents a culture of sharing. We share code. But it also represents a culture of, of, of discourse, of dialogue, of critique. So free software, people who engage in free software criticize each other's ideas. And there's a mantra in free software. There's an attitude in free software. Don't just talk about it. Show me. Don't just tell, but show. Show me the code. And so there's this, this emphasis within that community and within that culture of doing, of demonstrating, of critiquing. And it's that same culture. It's a culture of free software that we want to have um, uh, penetrate the, 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 the walls of the school. That in the classroom, we should have the same emphasis of, of doing, of critique of ideas, of, of, this, of this level of engagement. The role of the teacher changes suddenly. The teacher is no longer there to simply instruct. Although certainly there are times when the teacher has something to, to instruct, and that's fine. But the role of the teacher is now one that is more of a guide. It's going to guide the children to powerful ideas. It's going to guide the children to uh, processes and, and methodologies for uh, addressing problems. And one particular problem, one particular methodology, one particular opportunity, and this is why I think computation is so key, why the computer is, so much, is more than a pencil, is that computation gives you the opportunity to engage in debugging. And what debugging is, in, in computer terms, is it's finding problems in your software and fixing them. But debugging is something, it's a skill set that you're going to be able to apply throughout life in any, any field. We th think of the word debugging in, in the context of computer science, but debugging is a skill that applies in, in every domain. Now, the reason why debugging within the context of the computer is, is so valuable is because it's safe. Now, I want to make an analogy to the, the automotive industry. When I was a kid, cars were heavy, they were made of steel, and if, if you drove your car into a tree, the car would bounce off the tree, and nothing would happen to the car, because it was this big, heavy, rigid object. Now, that energy from the collision had to go somewhere, and it went to two places. One is, it went into the tree, so the tree itself would be damaged, and the other place that energy went was into the, the driver and the passenger of the car. And so driving, when I was young, wasn't very safe. But eventually the automotive industry discovered that people, or made the observation, that people are more important than cars. And so they invented this concept called the crumple zone. And what the crumple zone is, you can see here, is that when the car hits the tree, the, the car absorbs the energy. And so there's less damage to the tree, but more important, is less damage to the driver and the passenger. 
And so what we've done in sugar, what we've done in the context of our software, is design a crumple zone so that the children can explore and try things and debug and make mistakes without risk. And the, 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 the without risk is really important because if you want people to be creative, they've got to take risks, they've got to try things, they've got to explore. You can't be creative by just being incremental. You've got to be creative by, by trying new ideas. If there's a penalty for making a mistake that's too high, then very quickly we learn not to make mistakes. And as soon as we're in a context where we've learned not to make mistakes, we've also learned not to be creative. And so what we can do with computation, what we can do in the computer, and I'm not going to argue this is the only way to do it, but it's a very powerful way of doing it, is we can give the children a context in which they can make big mistakes with no penalty. We can give them a crumple zone so they can try things, explore, and really push the envelope with very little risk. They're not going to hurt themselves, they're not going to hurt the computer, they're not going to hurt other kids, but they are going to engage in, in, in lots of learning, lots of risk taking, lots of imagination, lots of creativity. Now, one of the things that we think is really important is that computation happen not just at a desk, but computation happens as part of life. That they're using the computer in all aspects of their life. The reason why it's a laptop is so that it can go outside of the classroom to where life is. And so that they can do things like, they can, these, are, these are simple little sensors that you can make for 50 cents. And these sensors let you measure things like temperature, like humidity, light, magnetic field, um, pressure, all different things that you can imagine. And with that, you can start to do science. With that, you can start to um, think about how does computation and the physical world interact. And you can begin to really explore things in a, in a much more tangible way. And particularly for young children, that, that, that sense of, of being tangible is very important. And so we really focus on making this be a very sensor-rich experience for the children. And in fact, the new version of, of Rodrigo's laptop is going to have many more sensors built in. So the idea that this really is a, a, a tool for you know, experience, exploring, measuring the world is, is, is critical to the learning. This is an example. Um, this was done by some university students in Uruguay designed a mechanism to turn Rodrigo's laptop into a robot. And then these are the children programming the robot. That actually brings up another point about why this is a free software project. And that is to say that it's, it's not complete. It doesn't come with, with, with everything finished the way an Apple product does. It comes with the expectation that it'll get finished by you. It'll get finished by the, the, the university students in Chile. It'll get finished by the teachers in Chile. It'll get finished by the children themselves. So it's, it's not something that is it, in our image. It's in the image of the people that use it. Now, I want to just give you a, a quick demo, uh, some concrete examples of what I'm talking about. And I'm going to start with an abacus. And I'll, I'll, I'll go to here. This is, um, this abacus is the abacus that was invented by the Chinese about 2,500 years ago. And the way an abacus works, you know, you eat these beads and this column are worth one, ten, a hundred, a thousand as you go across. And on top, they're worth five times as much. So if I drop a bead down here, this, this bead's worth five. Now, why do you need an abacus if you've got a computer with a calculator built in? Well, because it's important to understand things more than one way. It's important to understand that there are multiple representations of things. And particularly in terms of, of, of counting, it's, it's nice to have different representations. But it turns out that there's also, there are different abacus. The Chinese weren't the only ones to invent the abacus. The Romans invented the abacus as well, around the same time as the Chinese. And they invented actually the exact same abacus as the Chinese. 
Same thing, ones and fives. And probably that's because both of them use a counting system, base ten. They counted with their fingers, two hands, five, ten. Nothing too surprising there. But the Mayans also invented an abacus, independent of the Chinese and the Romans. The Mayans counted with their fingers and also with their toes. So the Mayan abacus is base 20. So again, we can expose the children to a different representation and we can begin to ask them, well, why? Why is the Mayan abacus different than the Roman abacus or the Chinese abacus? And how is it different? How can it be used in, in different ways? But we can go a little bit further. Now, I don't know how, some of you probably know this already about, about the Egyptians and how the Egyptians counted. The Egyptians counted like this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. They used the, the, the segments of their fingers to count, and that's why we have 12 hours in the day. We got 12, that unit from the Egyptians. So, but the Egyptians never invented an abacus. But let's build an abacus for the Egyptians. So we don't have to just receive the things that pre-existed, but we can also make things ourselves. So in sugar, many sugar activities have a little gear. And that gear is a sign to the children, um, time to make your own version. Time to invent your own representation. So in this case, we're going to make, uh, we want to have uh, an abacus for uh, base 12, let's make the Egyptian abacus. Here we go. I think, yep, yeah, that's the Egyptian abacus right there. We just did it. So the idea that the, it, it's not complete, we have something to add, we have something to make, is part of the, the culture we're trying to instill with the software. But I want to go one step further. I introduced the abacus program to some teachers in Kapkope. Kapkope is a little town about, a, about an hour to the east of Asuncion in Paraguay. And these teachers have been using sugar for a while. And they were interested in the abacus because they were interested in working with their children around their, their math curriculum that they get from the, the federal government. And there are all different ways in which they want to use this. But then they said, they asked a the question, could we somehow use an abacus to study fractions. And in the course of discussion, they invented, the teachers in Kakupe invented a new abacus. They invented an abacus that's new to the world. This is the Kakupe abacus. See, the Kakupe abacus. This abacus lets you work much the way the traditional abacus works, but it also lets you have halves and thirds, it lets you have fractions. It lets you add fractions and also subtract fractions. This is a new invention. I don't believe that this abacus ever existed anywhere in the world until the teachers in Kakute invented it. And to me, this is a, 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 an indication, it's a sign that what I believe is actually true. And what I believe is that teachers, just like the students, know how to learn are capable of learning and, and love to learn. And the teachers can be inventive just like students and just like university professors. That, that there's, if we make room for it, if we tell them, you know what, it's okay, you're allowed to be inventive, you're allowed to create, they'll do it. They're capable of doing it. So part of what we do to educate teachers is to educate them about the value of, of, of creativity, of innovation and that they're part of it. It's not something they receive, but they're part of it. And now the difficulty of that, and this is where I look for your help, the difficulty of that is that's a real change. Teachers expect to get something whole, something complete. They expect to get the app that is a lesson plan that's complete, that shows them how to explain this particular piece of a curriculum to the class. And that well, while sugar doesn't get in the way of that, we, we, we need more. And the, the teachers need more, and the teachers love it. The teachers love to learn, just as much as the kids love to learn. And when school is failing, it's because no one's learning. And when no one's learning, no one's in love with school. 
So let me show you a couple more examples. The program that uh, we were just running, I'm doing my presentation in, is a program called Turtler. So rather than giving the children PowerPoint, the children write PowerPoint. Uh, it sounds like a little bit of a stretch, but in fact, I've had second graders write PowerPoint. Um, in fact, I was just yesterday, I was at, a, at, at two schools in Santiago, and in the first school, the children were using a program called Scratch, which I think many of you are familiar with. And, uh, but it was clear to me that the children really didn't know what they were doing. They didn't really understand the tool. So we wrote Scratch in the car between the first school and the second school inside of Turtle Arts. So the children at the second school could actually see how all these things work. But let me just do a little, I'm just going to do a little bit of programming to give you the sort of idea of what the, the even you know, first and second graders can do. And I'll just make sort of the classic uh, logo, um, uh, the classic logo program. Um, I can tell the turtle to go forward. Every time I click on the block, the turtle goes forward. Very simple. I can tell the turtle to turn right 90 degrees. In fact, let me make this um, a little bit bigger so you can see it from the back of the room. Right, 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 forward. If it goes off the screen, I'll, I'll just put it back to the center. And if I snap these bricks together, I've made a little macro. Forward, right, forward, right. And now I'm going to do um, a little trick here. I'm going to use a block repetier. So repeat four times. And now what I've done is I've written a program to draw a square. And if I run that program, you'll see the turtle drawing a square. And I can drop on a, a Cartesian coordinate grid. And again, first and second grade children can start to explore Cartesian space using a tool like this and understand it. 